I'd like to call the October meeting of the Board of Education to order. First, we'll begin with an invocation. Ms. Etheridge. Good evening. Education is helping the child realize his pot potential. Jimmy. Jimmy challenged his teacher day after day. The lesson was always interrupted to deal with some outburst or rule infraction. Mrs. Jenkins tried strict adherence to her discipline plan. She tried ignoring his behavior. She even tried bribing Jimmy. All these solutions were short-lived. They were band-aids when only holistic care would do. As all teachers do, Mrs. Jenkins knew her students quite well. She knew Jimmy's likes and dislikes, strengths and weaknesses, gifts and talents, and she decided to try a combination approach that would address the whole child and not just his behavior since Jimmy was artistic, Mrs. Jenkins gave him the responsibility of making posters. Since he worked better alone than in a group, she assigned him specific tasks at group times. And since he liked attention, she called on him for answers even before he could raise his hand. In time, Jimmy's outburst decreased. His productivity increased. Mrs. Jenkins had found a better way for Jimmy and for herself. Try to always remember your students are more than a set of behaviors. They are people who have needs, desires, and preferences. When problems arise, look past the situation and into the child. Know your students well enough to identify what they need, then give it to them. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Keelan, have you ever led the Pledge of Allegiance? Yeah. Okay. All right. yeah. I guess Sydney would be next then. <laughs> would you all please rise? Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This month's school spotlight is on Central Elementary, and I'll call Principal Carrie Chapel forward. Good evening, Chairman Dobney, uh, Superintendent Stefanik, members of the board, and guests. I uh, thank you for inviting Central Ele Elementary to present this evening. It was my intention to have Deidre Simmons, our district preschool director and coordinator, to be here to present for you this evening. Because it was early in the year, we had a conversation, and I said, Deidre, have you ever presented on the preschool program? She said, no. And so, win-win. Yay, great. Um, as you can see, <laughs> Deidre is not here this evening for an even better reason. Her husband, Troy, got a call today that um, he is potentially right in line. He's been at the top of the transplant list for a kidney. Um, and they got the call today to get their stuff together. So um, well, there was a lot of cheering today at Central, a lot of jumping up and down, a little bit of tears, a lot of love and excitement. Um, and then she gives the board presentation, and I said, I'll just read your PowerPoint. So here I am <laughs> to read the PowerPoint. Um, and it's a shame that Deidre can't be here to present this for you because Deidre Simmons has such a passion and a calling for early intervention and for people, little people, especially uh, little people who might just need a little bit of extra support. And you're going to see that. She just basically kind of did a, the past, the present, and the future vision of the preschool program in her presentation, and I'm just going to kind of walk through that with you. Um, I am armed to try to answer any questions that you have, although if I don't know the answer, I'll be glad to find them out for you. So preschool services in Cartock County began in 1991. At that time, they served only students ages three to five years with disabilities. They were located behind Currituck County Middle School in a trailer, serving six to eight children with one teacher and two teacher assistants, and transportation was provided by parents or contract drivers. From 1993 to 1995, there was one developmental um, preschool serving only students with disabilities. 1993 to 1997, developmental day pre, or I'm sorry, developmentally delayed preschool learning lab, um, had high school students who were considered working in daycare or going to school to be teachers, um, they could get a course credit with the preschool. 
um, students were not exposed to peers and were in their most restrictive environment being housed at the high school. So they requested to be housed at Central Elementary School. That way those students would see your typical um, younger student. In 1997, they were moved to the Gray House on my campus, which is now our data um, office. <clears throat> and it became the new um, DD preschool. We continued to serve only students with disabilities, but class size began to increase from six students to 10 students. They also opened their first more at four preschools serving typically developing students at age four, and their first classroom housed 10 students. In 1998, they had a surge in population of students with significant needs and had to operate a morning and afternoon preschool, serving three-year-olds in the morning and four-year-olds in the afternoon and they served these 17 students with one teacher and two assistants. More at four continued to receive state funding, and the class size grew from 10 students to 14, including some students with disabilities. In 1999, they decided to become a licensed preschool and were moved out of the Gray House and into the school building as we exceeded the recommended floor space per child. And they continued to operate one developmentally delayed preschool and one more at four, continuing to grow to numbers until 2009. And the year 2000 was when I was first exposed to the program as that was my first year of teaching. And Central was one of my schools. And I taught, Buck Green said, you're going to teach a block of music to the um, self-contained class. And I did that. And then about three days later, the preschool class joined the self-contained class, and we all had music together, which was a good time. So that was my first introduction to Deidre and the program. <clears throat> 2009 to 2016, they continued to operate two developmental delay preschools with a maximum class size of 12 students per class. Um, they expanded the NC pre-K then to Jarvisburg, so then we had two, one at Central and one at Jarvisburg, serving 18 students at Jarvisburg and 18 at Central. They're a little out of order here. 2016, they relocated that program from Jarvisburg to Griggs because Jarvisburg school got too full with K-5 students, so they moved the preschool to Griggs that had a little more room. 17-18 school year, we had a large amount of developmentally delayed students found to be eligible and had to open a third developmental delay classroom in November of 2017. That was last year. We are currently serving 23 developmentally delayed students in two EC classrooms at Central, 18 um, NC pre-K students at Central, 18 NC pre-K students at Griggs, and this year we opened a new developmental delay classroom at Griggs and are serving seven students there. Each year for the last five years, we have reached capacity in those developmental delay classrooms of 12 prior to December. The NC pre-K waiting list continues to be between 10 to 14 additional students for each class without us being able to serve those students. Uh, with the increase in military families in our community. In order to get into the NC pre-K program, you have to, um, they can be military or they have um, low income or are at risk in some manner. So we have a waiting list of 10 to 14 outside of what we're serve currently serving. <clears throat> uh, the future for the preschool program in Deidre's eyes here. Um, we are looking for outside resources and funding to be able to reach most students that would be eligible for services. Like I said, it's a passion and a calling for her, so she's looking for any way possible. Um, she would like to see pre-K classrooms based elsewhere besides Central because it would help with the transportation issue as we do transfer students from the Milliac line all the way to Central. Um, she has applied for a developmental day license at Central to assist with EC needs of developmental students. Um, we are waiting approval of that license. So I asked her about this one specifically because I figured, hmm, you might have a question about it. So uh, developmental day license provides additional funds in assisting with supplies and materials or staffing when we provide services for children who have high adaptive needs. Um, we have applied for the license and once the license comes through, we can apply for the funding. Um, it attaches to teachers with birth to K license, and the class size cannot exceed 12, and that is an annual application. And basically, Ms. Margie at the state level has said that we qualify with the programs that we have. We just had to apply for a different licensure. Um, she's also looking to provide and researching um, to offer preschool to staff children and possibly local government agencies' children a fee-for-service pre-K. Um, if you're not aware or don't have families with small children in your circle of life, Currituck does not have a very strong preschool 
daycare population for anybody who works. Most of the preschools that are in our community are half day um, and not every day of the week. So it's very difficult for people with young kids to find um, very good child care. So she's looking to be able to offer that maybe to our staff or local government agencies. And that would all be funded through payment. They would just pay for that and that would cover the teachers and et cetera. Um, and she's also looking for an additional um, developmental pre-K soon because um, as prior to December, as numbers from our early intervention birth to three-year-olds transition to preschool. So we work closely with the early interventionists um, in our area and they give us names of students and then we start screening them and once they turn three years old, we then start to provide services for them because they age out of the early intervention. Um, and we find children, it seems, almost every day. So um, that's it. And do you have any questions that I might be able to answer I'm for you? I'm telling you that what she's got planned for staff's children, I think would really help us draw teachers. It would, and I remember before the NC Pre-K program became as big as it was, that one time was even a possible option, because I know I was approached when my children were little. Um, and what comfort that would bring to know that my kid is in this safe environment and on the same schedule that I'm on. Um, so yes, that would be a big draw. And I've visited those classrooms and it's just, it's delightful to watch those children and you've visited them too, haven't you? Oh Don? yeah. <laughs> Dr. I Rodney? have a special appreciation for preschool <laughs> handicapped teachers. Mm -hmm. You helped, did you a help couple, for A couple years ago yeah. when you had your teacher uh, <laughs> Christmas lunch and I volunteered to go into the pre-K handicap figuring out oh, it's going to be a piece of cake. It's like those kids <laughs> ran me ragged. <laughs> yes. He's still in therapy after okay. that. He's still a couple well, years later. Come back. That's preschool's my happy place. So if it's been a bad day, I'm usually on the floor somewhere. I can't get through an observation that my ears aren't checked or, you know, my arm measured or <laughs> the blocks are brought and built around me or something. They are sweet. That it's a good a time. sweet age. Yeah. Please give Deidre our love yes. and I best will. wishes and especially for her husband and his transplant. Hope everything goes as well yes i contacted her before i came in and she said they still have up to 24 hours to know for sure but they're they're getting their stuff together just for board member and audience member information um that transition to from transition early intervention to age three um that identified population we have to provide um, services uh, intervention services to them if they're identified right that is correct that is okay. correct they then they then um through the early intervention process, then they are given a, an IEP, and we, as the district that they live in, are required to provide services for them. So that's that's the um, Brenda Norris. urgency with Deidre is that we can't tell them no. We have to we have to find something for right. them. Mm -hmm. So once we meet those class capacities, if students keep coming, then we have to open uh, another uh, developmentally. Uh, uh, delayed uh, uh, preschool program so Part uh, of yes mm -hmm. and so we have to go through classroom inspection process by the east uh, state ec department and special and preschool department and so uh, if she sees those numbers coming we'll probably have to do that mid-year we're ready <laughs> having to go through mid-year last year i was ready on the ground running this year too oh yeah it, it just it always it amazed me this is the the second state i've been involved in and even in an active school the classroom has to be, you know, inspected and has to be relicensed for preschool, and so uh, it could have been used for education for decades and decades. Uh, it doesn't pass preschool muster unless they come out and, and license it themselves. Before I go to the next agenda item, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that we lost another uh, staff member a couple weeks ago, uh, Miss Brenda Norris, who. Was it data processing? Data processing coordinator, yes. She was in charge of the registration center. All right. So, anyway, I'd like to take a moment of silence for her and her family. Thank you. Next, approval of the agenda. Before I ask for approval, I would like to pull out from the consent agenda, let's see, items two, three, four, five, and six.
Those are all second readings of policies. And I would like to place those plus the greenhouse discussion that we did not have at the work session after item E, where Superintendent Stefanik will go over the safety committee recommendations. So it will be greenhouse discussion, then we'll deal with policies 3410, 6420, 9120, and 5010, and 1710. And we will vote on each one of those at the end since this is the second reading. Do I, do I have a motion for approval of the agenda? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> motion passes. Next, uh, public comment session. We do have one person that signed up, and it happens to be the newly named principal at J.P. Knapp Early College, Ms. Denise Fallon. I have a, is this on? Oh, I have a student with me tonight. Jacob, if you'll come on up. So the reason I'm here tonight during this portion of um, the board meeting, we got some information earlier in the week, and um, we were asked to do this during an awards ceremony, which we don't have until January, and we just didn't want to wait till then. <laughs> so here we are. Jacob, thanks for coming tonight. No problem. Um, so, of course, it's my pleasure to be here this evening. Each fall, all 11th grade students at J.P. Knapp um, take the PSAT. And the PSAT is a practice test for the SAT, obviously. Um, but exemplary scores qualify students for the National Merit Scholarship Program. This year, College Board um, notified us that one of our students had been recognized as a commended student. And so, uh, again, it is my honor and pleasure privileged to announce today that Jacob Herwick has been named as a commended student in the 2019 National Merit Scholarship Program. And I have to be honest with you, um, Jacob, you're the only student that I can remember that's got this honor. So congratulations to you. Wow. About 35,000 commended students throughout the nation are being recognized for their exceptional academic promise. Although they will not continue on in the competition for the National Merit Scholarship, commended students place among the top 50,000 scorers on that PSAT. The young men and women being named as commended students have demonstrated outstanding potential for academic success. These students represent a valuable national resource, and recognizing their accomplishments as well as their key role in their schools is important in their academic development. Again, um, congratulations to Jacob, and I'm just going to let Jacob take a second and tell you a little bit about what he's studying. Uh, he is one of our students that's going to graduate this year with uh, an associate degree. So, Jacob, again, congratulations. Tell these guys who you are and what you're studying. Uh, so, I am a senior at J.P. Knapp. I am currently uh, pursuing a associates in engineering at the College of the Albemarle. I am set to graduate this spring, and... Right now, I'm taking like all classes at the Elizabeth City campus. Mm -hmm. I don't get to see my lovely high school that often anymore. <laughs> no, so I'm glad you're here tonight. What um, now? Have you applied to your colleges yet? Uh, not yet, but the I'm planning on um, applying to NC State, and the early action deadline <laughs> is the 15th. So I will very soon be applying to that. Good for you. And, and just to follow up next week, Jacob, is Countdown to College Week at mm -hmm. J.P. Nass. So if you don't have COA on Monday and Tuesday, mm -hmm. you can come in and get help with those applications. Good so I'll see you there. <laughs> <laughs> so here you go, Jacob. It's your letter of accommodation again. Congratulations. Let's give him a big round of applause. <laughs> Jacob. Now, can I just say that I know Jacob is one of the 
one people who I know works the hardest that I have ever known. And especially out of the engineering, I'd say he's probably the one of the hardest workers. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, congratulations, Jacob. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, next student board member reports. Keel and Sydney, Colin and Mallory. Hello, board. Uh, I'd like to offer one more congratulations to Jacob and uh, get right into it. So first up is Moyak Elementary. What an eventful fall already at Moyak Elementary. We've had Master Huang of Moyak come teach students the art of Taekwondo during PE classes. Channel 13 News came to observe the MES PTA's Penny Wars in support of one of our sweet Panthers who has a brain mass. And of course, we're continuing to hashtag learn, play, dream, grow each and every day. We hope you make plans to attend the MES Annual Fall Festival on October 26th, which will go from 6 to 8 p.m. It's sure to be a fun family event. Next is Jarvisburg Elementary. JES kicked off the school year with a back-to-school night and PJ Jam. East Carolina Radio was on hand to broadcast live from the event. Kids stayed in the gym to dance the night away while parents were able to visit classrooms to see firsthand all of the amazing things happening to J at JES. It was our largest turnout ever. On October 19th, Roanoke Island Festival events will be supplementing our fourth graders' understanding of NC history with an assembly at 2 p.m. Our Title I Reading Night will coincide with our annual Readathon fundraiser sponsored by our PTA on October 25th, 2018. We will host a trick or treat event in which students will learn a literacy trick for a, tri for a treat in the classroom. Dinner will be served for parents and students. It will be a fun night for sure. More information will be forthcoming. We hope to see you all there. And finally for me, Central Elementary so Central Elementary had their first Title I night of the year with a learning fair that included fair food, the book fair, fair games for students, and learning presentations for families. More than 150 or 140 were in attendance. October 18th, our PTO is having their general meeting and bingo night. October will include our annual costume parade and PBIS reward day on the 31st. And with that, I turn it over to <coughs> Sydney. Hello, I'd like to start with Sharborough Char Elementary School, who hosted their, who hosted Master Wong Taekwondo Studio during PE classes this past Monday and Tuesday. Master Huang and his team led students in Taekwondo exercises and focused it on character building. All students and parents are invited this Saturday for our. Kicking Saturday event for free in SES Gym. Progress reports will go home Friday, October 5th. Picture day will be Wednesday, October 10th. Sharbro's Title I team has rescheduled our kickoff to a great year event for Wednesday, October 10th at 545. Come join us for dinner and information regarding our school. Sharbro will participate in the Red Ribbon Week, October 22nd through October 26th. More information to come regarding these weekly events. Next, I will go on to Griggs Elementary School. The mystery of the lost colony is being presented to our students tomorrow. The Mallards will have their first PBIS recognition on Tuesday, October 9th. Griggs Elementary School will host their first Harry Potter Family Fest Title One Night on Friday, October 12th. Please come out and join us for a fun event, including learning activities, crafts, snacks, and snacks. Red Ribbon Week activities will take place October 22nd through the 26th. On October 31st, students will have the opportunity to dress as their favorite character, book characters. And now I'll pass it to Colin. Uh, first, we're going to start off with, uh, <clears throat> oh man, Knott's Island Elementary. Knott's Island Elementary is looking forward to an exciting start to the fall season. Progress reports will be going home on the 5th. Our book fair is running through Monday, October 8th. Bike Rodeo Week 
For the 3rd through 5th grades will begin Monday, October 8th also. Students can make memories with their beautiful smiles with Picture Day on October 19th. The annual Fall Festival is on Saturday, October 20th from 12 to 2. Come join us for some fall fun. Next, from Curta County Middle. Despite our two weeks off, the students at, and staff at CCMS are hard at work. Our teachers had a very productive teacher work day and want to thank the board for giving them valuable time to perfect their craft. Also, our entire certified staff is participating in a year-long book study on growth mindset. Our Raiders, our Raider athletes continue to demonstrate great athleticism and sportsmanship as they compete against other teams in the conference. We had our first school dance last Friday, which was a lot of fun. The students and staff at CCMS are currently participating in a drive that will support both Havelock and Tucker Creek Middle Schools in Craven County. We are collecting books, school supplies, and backpacks. Feel free to drop donations off in the bins in our lobby. Finally, we have our fall book fair going on. Stop by and support our media center by purchasing some books. Next, we have Moyock Middle School. Moyock Middle School had the first school dance in the year last Friday night. Over 400 students were in attendance. They danced the night away and had a great time. The Junior Beta Club, FBLA, and 4 Club are currently collecting items for Hurricane Florence victims. FFA had their first field trip on Wednesday afternoon to CCHS to attend leadership training. The students are excited about opportunities in FFA and are looking forward to their next field trip later in October. Next, I hand it off to Mallory. All right, I'm going to start with the JP Knapp Early College. Um, SGO sponsor Mr. Chuck Martin and student representatives will travel to Craven County Early College tomorrow, Friday, to deliver hurricane relief supplies collected by the SGO students and staff there. Our colleagues at Craven Early College related to tell us that the Early College alone, they had 20 students and families that were majorly impacted by the storm and three staff members who lost everything. Mm -hmm. COA will be closed on Monday and Tuesday for staff professional development. Um, Monday to Thursday of next week is the SGO Spartan Spirit Week. Um, next week is also the Countdown to College Week 2018 at the JP Knapp Early College. Monday and Tuesday there will be one-on-one -on -one assistance for seniors from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. with college applications and essays, the CFNC Common App, RDS, and FSA ID. Wednesday is FAFSA night for seniors and parents from 4 to 7 at JP Knapp. Thursday is the Transfer Summit for grades 12 and 13 from 4 to 7 in the Media Center. The topic is Understanding How COA Credits Transfer to a University. On Wednesday, the PSAT will be given for the 11th graders from 8.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And next Friday is an optional teacher workday at JP Knapp Early College. Sophomores will be job shadowing all over the community this day. At Currituck County High, they continue to accept donations of supplies to assist those in Craven County so heavily impacted by Hurricane Florence. Our first carload of donations made its way to them this past weekend. CCHS was honored to host the Northeast NC chapters of FFA for its annual fall symposium. Some 300 students accompanied by their faculty sponsors were in attendance. They enjoyed a wonderful open house from 5 to 7 p.m. on Thursday, September 27th, where parents enjoyed meeting new teachers and learning more about student activities and community outreach organizations. Food trucks were even on site to assist families needing to purchase dinners at the supper hour. Students continuing to thrive. The students are continuing to thrive in our fall sports and extracurriculars with homecoming slated for Friday, October 19th. That evening, the Knights will host the Bears of Hertford County High. That's it. Great. Keelan, Sydney, Colin, and Mallory, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next item on the agenda, safety committee recommendations. Superintendent Stefanik. Thank you, Dr. Dobney. Uh, just commenting about the Moyak Middle School dance. Um, 400. Major league, major league line of cars, uh, you know, dropping uh, people off. I was uh, taking care of an errand uh, up on the north end, and it, it looked like a, uh, you know, like a concert at, a, at an amphitheater or something. I mean, there were cars just going and going. I mean, I'm going like, ah, oh, the first dance. That's right, the first <laughs> dance. So it, was, uh, so it was very well attended on the, on the north side. 
I was asked tonight to uh, give an update on uh, our safety committee and the work that we did um, uh, last spring. Um, we had um, several uh, community members. We had members of the um, county commissioners. We had uh, um, uh, Sheriff Bikert. Uh, we had uh, the community members that were there. All of them seemed to have uh, a major amount of law enforcement uh, background from uh, local law enforcement agencies all the way up to the FBI. So we had uh, uh, we have some uh, pretty uh, expert uh, folks uh, in attendance at the safety committee. Um, and we came up with three uh, recommendations that we wanted to target. Uh, first recommendation was uh, uh, an SRO uh, in every school uh, in the district, uh, advancing up from the, the three buildings that uh, we had um, as of last year. Um, we are continuing uh, to uh, brainstorm ideas on how to make that happen uh, and uh, trying to partner with the Sheriff's Department to see if um, uh, there's some shift work that ha can happen and, and we can get some more uh, uh, deputies in the schools. But as of now, um, as mentioned previously, we did receive um, a safety grant uh, from the state of North Carolina uh, for an additional um, SRO. Uh, and what that does is that provides half uh, of the, uh, the salary of, of an SRO to bring in. So we'll have uh, both middle schools and both high schools uh, having their own designated uh, uh, SROs. Uh, right now we've got kind of a, a round robin uh, SRO activity till they get the shifts and the personnel uh, the way they want them. Uh, and then uh, when it's finished, then we should have uh, four designated folks for our, our four buildings. Um, second recommendation was uh, what I like to uh, uh, lovingly call the uh, Jenna locks, uh, which are the uh, uh, the extra classroom and, and uh, support room uh, bar locks uh, that uh, are on the, the classroom doors and, and pretty much all the doors in the schools except for maybe storage closets. Uh, and uh, those are installed. Um, they're, um, uh, Matt's not here right now, but um, the, the biggest concern was where to put the the actual device because it's just like a a call it a U a U bar or something like that where to actually store it so that um, mischievous students uh, may not try to take it uh, and and do something with it as uh, you know as maybe a prank to the classroom uh, but it could at the same time be close enough to the door uh, that if it needs to be used for safety reasons it could uh, uh, it could be utilized and, and access easily so um, the actual brackets are on the doors and in the floors and the devices are in the rooms we're just trying to get the uh, uh, the storage uh, a little uh, I think they're plastic uh, cases uh, attached to uh, each classroom. Uh, the commissioners uh, were uh, generous enough to uh, reimburse the school district. Um, that process, uh, I just got an email the other day that I'm supposed to do something with that uh, to get the reimbursement back. So I've got to send some documentation over to the uh, uh, county manager and get that on the next agenda, and then we'll get the money back for the, uh, for the Genelox. Um, so that was appreciated uh, uh, from the county commissioners. The last uh, uh, item. And uh, some of you experienced that this evening. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the locking doors at, uh, at all of our facilities, and you have to press the safety doorbell to get in, uh, but it doesn't work that well if there aren't any folks at the desks where the, uh, the doorbell rings. Uh, you can't get in uh, after hours, but uh, all of our campuses are locked. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, buzzer systems uh, to uh, notify the, the office that you're there, and then you have to uh, get buzzed in after you identify and we can uh, uh, be sure that you're there for positive reasons. Um, we are in the process of going through a staff ID um, process, and then your ID card uh, will be um, your access key to the school. Uh, some of the folks already have, uh, in, in, in a precursor to the IDs, they have uh, key fobs. And uh, I was with Mr. Mullins yesterday as we started our uh, capacity tours. Uh, we started those yesterday, and he strolled right up to the door and waved the fob, uh, you know, by his shoulder, and the door popped open, and uh, and we walked uh, uh, straight in. That's what the um, ID cards will be able to do. Uh, and so uh, staff um, won't have to use the buzzer system to get into other schools. They'll have the, the staff access card. The trick to that first of all, getting everybody's picture taken uh, for ID cards. But uh, the other part of it is we have to code each person's ID card based on what type of access they're given. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so some will be given, you know, the essential personnel will be given 24-7 access to certain buildings. Other folks will be on some kind of a uh, less than 24-hour um, access uh, piece. And if you're a, a staff member at, say, Moyak Elementary School, your ID pass won't be good to get you into the high school. Uh, and so we have to put all those codes into the computer system, and so uh, the ID cards uh, will work. The first preliminary target was by Christmas break. I don't know uh, if, we'll, if we'll make that yet, but uh, we'll give it a shot to put those in. So those are the first three uh, recommendations uh, from the uh, um, safety committee, and two of them fully implemented, and the uh, SRO uh, additions to the school district were on our way uh, with one additional SRO uh, as of this fall. Can the ID cards be canceled through the computer? So say a staff member left? Yes, yes. Yeah, all updates uh, um, can happen uh, probably in, in real time. So if somebody uh, resigns and just about the same time we cancel their email account, we can uh, turn off their ID cards too. Will the ID cards allow teachers to come out on weekends those that want to work in their classroom? Or Yes. Um, I, I had uh, uh, some familiarity with this with a, a previous district. You just put... Um, um, well, I guess what you could call non-alarm times um, at the schools. So it may not be, you know, if some people like to come out at like 9 p.m., uh, they might not be able to do that on a weekend, but you might be able to come out, let's say, 8 to 6, something like that, in that range, and, and your ID card would work, and then the alarm systems would go on, and then the card wouldn't work at, um, on those off times. We'll try to give as big a window as we can on the weekends because we know people like to, to do that. They have some quiet uh, minutes to get some things done, and so we'll, we'll make that uh, available to them. I'm just happy that we're implementing these safety yep. um, items mm -hmm. to all the schools. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been a while coming, so I'm just really happy to hear the news. A couple other things, uh, so I don't have to say it during uh, uh, comments at the end. Um, uh, we are four for four. Uh, I believe I said the last time we were three for three uh, on the safety grants. Uh, we were notified this week that our partner agency uh, got the fourth one for uh, mental health services, uh, and it's also for um, staff training uh, where they'll train teachers on um, being able to spot early signs of um, you know, uh, anxiety or um, situational, you know, depression or, or some changes in, in student personality so that they could uh, possibly get a mental health services uh, in, in a quicker time frame. So SRO, um, extra social worker for on-staff uh, assistance, um, school, School, school safety equipment, and so uh, we can add to uh, uh, any camera systems where we think there might be some blind spots uh, in the schools. We can add some uh, camera equipment there, and then the partnership grant with a, um, a community uh, mental health provider. Mm -hmm. So we put in, we took the time to put in four grants, and we were we were granted all four of them from the state. That's very good. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, uh, next item: greenhouse discussion. Ms. Rose. <clears throat> Okay, <laughs> I've talked to uh, Mr. Monroe and Ms. Swain and Mr. Meads and some FFA students, one that lives at my house, and <laughs> their thoughts are that we need to go on and move on this project. You know, we, we, we've been talking about it since May, and we've been before the commissioners, and the commissioners, several of them, along with the county manager, have indicated that they support a new greenhouse. They have also said that they are not willing to fund the whole thing. They want us to have some ownership in it. And um, there's been some questions about why was, not, why was this not put into the budget. But the plan last year was to get a grant. You know, you're talking about grants, and they had it all written up, and only to discover that that grant, it, had, it was only for mobile materials. So the greenhouse is a permanent structure, so it did not qualify for the grant. So at that point, the FFA group and the teachers started looking for other avenues, not wanting to wait another year, because the situation with their old structure 
It's it's in a mess. Um, it's in bad condition. It's an outdated design. There's rotting wood structure frame. It's out. The polycarbonate is out of date. They're not able to grow a lot of things like mums. They had a call this week. Someone wanted 300 mums. They have no mums. They they don't have the facility to grow them. They can't grow poinsettias. That's a big fundraiser for them but they have to buy them and just add a little tiny bit of money for profit. Uh, our neighboring counties, one of them, Pasquotank, I believe had a 50-50 agreement between the Board of Education and the county commissioners to fund their project for their new greenhouse, which was in 1997. Both of our ag teachers, Ms. Swain and Mr. Meads, went through that program and it benefited them greatly. In fact, Ms. Swain went on to pursue a degree in horticulture. From She was so interested um, and gained so much from that greenhouse. Curry Tuck County is an agricultural-based community, and our goal is to prepare students for the workplace and to have the opportunity to stay and live and work in Curry Tuck County. We feel like this greenhouse might encourage that in some way with some students. Time is a factor due to high school scheduling. This semester, they did not offer horticulture because of the condition of the greenhouse. We're hoping that, uh, I'm sure they'll offer horticulture in a, and just do what they can if, if we don't have it in place for them. The sequence of classes, those children that took horticulture last year want to take or well, number one, they want to take number two this year. I have a daughter that wanted to take horticulture one this semester, but it wasn't offered. Sun Energy has been contacted multiple times by Abby, who spoke to us originally about it. And finally today, they did commit to a dollar figure. They said possibly $5,000. Um, that they will give, but that's kind of contingent upon their presence in the community. I think that there's an ordinance coming up that the commissioners will be reviewing, and I think um, Sun Energy is looking to see if they'll even be in the county maybe in that capacity. So they want to support counties that I guess are supporting their business. Um, We've talked to Senator Cook's office and Representative Steinberg's office, and they both would like to help as well, but they like for local to have some meat in the game. So um, I think it's kind of time for us to do something. You asked for more than one estimate. I think that was you, Mr. Crotick, that asked for that. So we have two proposals. One, the educational greenhouse, I believe, was 76000 then they got another estimate from another one that was like 125. That was not the teaching educational greenhouse. I'm sorry, 123,000. That was just a regular greenhouse. But the one that our teachers, Mr. Mr. Meads and Ms. Swain, would prefer is the educational teaching greenhouse. It just goes better with uh, teaching the curriculum. They asked for a third estimate. However, that person was not able to get it together soon enough for us. So that's the greenhouse presentation as I have it. Uh, Mr. Monroe is here. Maybe he'd like to add something. I see that. I'll put me on the spot right there. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's been a lot of uh, energy put into this greenhouse uh, project. It's a student level, a teacher level, and it is a very good. Uh, project, it would benefit the students greatly. Uh, this area is mainly agricultural. We would love to train the students to stay here, work here, and raise their families here. So we think it would be very beneficial. And even from a business perspective, you know, when they can grow their moms and their poinsettias and look at the expense and the time and then sell them to the community and look at the profit, I mean, it's it's really more than just the ag factor, you know. It's it's a really broader uh, sense of education opportunity. Did the people? Oh, go ahead, Will. I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just wondering, did the people that did these bids are they aware of the 
local building codes? They are. In fact, the one with the educational greenhouse had to go back and revise it to meet our wind standards. 120 miles an hour? Mm-hmm because that one was shared with the county manager's office, and they contacted Ms. Swain, I believe, and said this doesn't meet our wind code, and so she in turn contacted the manufacturer who did up it. Mr. Monroe, uh, have, uh, have you had an opportunity to look at this uh, proposed greenhouse? I have. Okay. Yeah, one more time. Uh, when we look at you know, the greenhouse and, and kind of recap a little bit, a lot of the estimates are given for a standard uh, greenhouse when I use in industry. The educational greenhouse is set up to accommodate maybe there's 25 or 30 students to be working in there. A standard greenhouse, the layout wouldn't really be the best for something like that. And that's why we really are focusing on that on that educational greenhouse. Those classes are well attended. Um, the cap is 30 students, 25, 30 students. And both Missy and Daniel Reed. That's probably the best the best one to look at for what we want to do. And the cheapest. <clears throat> Actually, you come in the cheapest, yes. Yeah. Uh right. So it's only got I mean, maybe this is fine, but it's only got four uh hundred and fifteen outlets in it. And it's uh thirty by ninety six. Just point it out. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I don't know, and, and, and I'm not saying this isn't what they need, but so this company out of Georgia will sell it and crate it, and I don't see anything in here about shipping, but I'm assuming that's calculated in here, for $52,780. But then if we want them to install it, it's $24,000. Um, I don't, I don't know. I'd have to look this over further. I, I, I'm not quite sure what makes it, not that it isn't cheaper, but I'm trying to figure out what makes it much different than the educational because uh, if it is, I'm not seeing it and I'm not saying it isn't, but just trying to figure it out. Cause it just looks like, a somebody's got an engineer on staff and I'm not saying they might not put additional braces and what have you because when I've dealt with other things that's generally what happened like garage doors they put a another support on each door and that increases the wind load uh, and so they got it up to 127 uh, miles per hour and uh, but I, I'm trying to figure out what 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 uh, outside of that and, and it's and it's 96 30 by 96 which is you know a nice size but in one case, it was a height of the outside wall. The one standard greenhouse only had a five foot outside wall, which would limit the amount of students you could put in that greenhouse. The other was kind of the layout inside, so the availability of more room in there to have those students in there. Okay. Probably well, some kind of table in the center where you could actually do a teaching. Right. And in many cases, the educational greenhouse things are hardwired in. You mentioned the outlets. Those, um, everything, the pans, everything are hardwired in where you wouldn't really need the receptacle Oh, and, and there's one other thing I just noticed on this. This, if we did go with this, not saying this would be a deal breaker, but this does not include site prep, permits, or slab. So I would just ask that we start with the 52,780 if we were to do it, and we look into the 24,000 and see if we couldn't bid that out, the installation. And if we were to do this, and we might find that we could maybe get it with the slab for the same price or maybe not much more. I don't know that we can. I, I do not know. But the little bit of electrical work, they're only going to put a 100-amp panel in there and four outlets and not a lot of plumbing. It's going to be seven spigots. And I don't know. It's $24,000. It's a third of the cost. I would encourage us to consider using some local people to install it find out what the cost of the slab is so we know what the site is going to cost to have it prepped and totally ready if we did pull the trigger on the seventy six thousand dollars but I also think um, we should be getting um, we should be qualifying for uh, or applying 
and hopefully qualify for other grants that I know are available. Well, the Carolina Ag, Ag, Carolina. Ag uh -huh. Carolina, that grant, they looked at that as well, and they are going to apply for that, but then that is a $5,000 standalone grant, right. meaning we couldn't put that 5000 on this. Why couldn't we? Because that's part of the criteria of the grant. They want it to fund a project. It's up to $5,000. They want it to fund a project from start to finish. Miss Swain did look at that one, and okay. she is she I, is I going to. A, I didn't see that part in that. Could yeah. be. <laughs> Where would it go, Janet? Where? Well, they'd like it in the existing area. But do you have three thousand square feet right there? I believe they have figured that they do. Really? Yeah. You do. What's the current What's the current size of the greenhouse? The, of the the existing, the one we have already. Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, my question, too, was you said that the county was willing to um, assist with some of this, but they wanted, you know, well, the county, the can't, that's right. They have given not, you a number. They have not. No one wants to take the bull by the horns. Okay. Well, they, I think they would need some assurance from us that we're going to fund it. Yeah. And the obvious time to do it would be the next budget cycle. Yeah. Because then they'll see that we do have it in the budget. Also, if we did this during the school year, it would concern me about the student safety yeah. because you're going to have demolition of the present greenhouse and then the construction of a new greenhouse. And I don't know how many of you have ever been back there to see the, you know, where the students go. They're going to have to walk right by that in order to get to the uh, building, uh, the present building. Well, I like uh, Will's idea about getting some bids for the contracting work. I mean, you, you can get a lot of your site work locally they may be able to donate their time just you know right to say to concrete Mike. concrete you could get your concrete at cost you know they'll they'll you know charge you a little bit but you could probably get it at cost at least if not of some of it donated um i think we need to really investigate that a little bit more because that's quite a savings of twenty five thousand dollars i am in agreement with the greenhouse i'd love to have have it at our school <laughs> So whatever it takes to, to make it happen, I'm in full agreement. But I do think we need to sub out the cost what of, we can. of building it. Are you Mr. Moore, what grant was it that we applied for that they turned down? Do you know? The so mobile there, grant? The yeah. yeah. one. You don't know which one it was? The one you said you didn't qualify for. Oh, Sorry. And there's a little bit of misconception about that, too. Um, we had looked at some grants, but the original monies we're looking at were CTE money, federal, okay. federal monies. Okay. Okay. And when we looked further into that, and I talked to the folks at the EPI, they said anything that was not a mobile, a structure, a permanent structure, could not be funded. Could not be funded. Okay. Mm -hmm. So things that were inside that, makes that sense. Yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, pensions, those type of things, uh, ventilations, those could be anything non mobile could not be funded through federal money. I think, you know, with the concern for demolition, and uh, I think Matt would be a good person to talk with, Matt Mullins. Mm -hmm. And he, I don't think it's going to take that long. And I know it's not going to be, the noise is not going to be a factor because I hear noise when I'm out there all the time in the automotive department. So, yeah, you know. I'm pretty sure you might be able to blow that a down. strong wind may take the existing... <laughs> Greenhouse down. We were hoping with Florence coming this way, <laughs> but, but it didn't happen. Because which I'm thankful that Florence did not come this way. My goodness. In, in all the discussion we've had, just wondering, looking, there are some grants out there um, that could support. And in fact, the neighboring district said, "Look at Farm Bureau because they sponsor a lot of these types of initiatives." Mm -hmm. Um, Golden Leaf Grants will fund agricultural-based product projects, and they offer two hundred thousand dollars grants. Wow! Is well, this is, is this is great. So, with farmers for rural education, a local farmer can nominate a district, uh -huh. and then they qualify for a twenty-five thousand dollars grant. And the grant specifically says to renovate or start new existing greenhouses. Okay, so I know you've been in on all these discussions since May. So are you, have you checked into any of these for them? Well, I read on all of them today. I mean, just in a 30-minute Google search, literally. Okay. Those are things that popped up as opportunities for us to apply for. 
Um, like the farmer's one has a January open date for the grant period, and again, it takes a local farmer to nominate your school district. You get a PIN number. I'm pretty sure that <laughs> and then that you, you James go through and apply um, for that process. The okay. Golden Leaf has a long process that you also have to go through. It's um, a competitive process, but most of our neighboring districts have Golden Leaf grants. Okay. Sometimes it depends on your socioeconomic status, but. When well, I talked to somebody today, they said you should definitely try that route. And I think that's great. I really do. But we've got commissioners and a county manager that is willing to support us on this at this time. And um, I don't want us to miss that opportunity of that money either. So I don't want us to drag our feet, so to speak. I mean, May, June, July, August, September. This has been going on five months. <clears throat> I, I think we should uh, try your grants. I think we should uh, share that initial um, information that you have with the county manager, and the, hopefully he'll share it with the commissioners. And I think um, at the end of the day, uh, if we can't get a grant, they're supposed to be in charge of capital and paying for it, so we should uh, tell them we need a capital improvement. <laughs> I mean, you know? They're, they're in charge of paying for buildings, and it's not about a, a building or not. <laughs> so. And and I'm all I'm all for that as well. It's just you know I do want us to keep in mind that our high school students are there for a short time to use this greenhouse. And um, Sydney can certainly tell us a little bit about it. Have you taken horticulture, Sydney? I was planning to take horticulture this year, but since we're not providing horticulture one this year because of the condition that it's in, it mm -hmm. made that impossible for me this year. And if conditions aren't able to improve, then they may just continue the students that are have already taken horticulture one and let them finish their journey in that class and wait until the greenhouse has been fixed yes. until they let a new generation get into it. And I know personally my sister has been in ag since I was in sixth grade I believe and I've been in that greenhouse since then watering those plants for them and helping out with that because of the conditions it's really it's you can't grow things in there like it's it's really bad so we should meet with the commissioners over at the greenhouse and we should research the um the grants <clears throat> the grants we should share that information preliminary with them we should reach out to the people of the North Carolina uh, extension agency see if they got any uh, extra ideas and we should um see if they'll build a greenhouse and with the and i money. think i think that's good but you know hearing hearing the suggestion that the perfect time to look at it is the budget time i mean that's not until may i i don't i don't suggest that we do all that work before the budget i, I suggest we do all that work and then i think if we can get uh some um uh, commitment from any of the other people um, of any size, then we could consider um, doing something further. But right now, I don't think we have the, enough The commissioners have not committed to an amount, but well, I'm inclined that, to think they would match us. But when you share that proposal with them, they might. Okay. Well, I think they need to see it. That's what I I'm saying. So we, we share that with they them. Have, we they have actually, there, so. well, Dan Scanlon saw it. Well, so. that, that's what I said. We should meet them yeah, over they there. they need to see it because we, it's easy know. to sit here and describe it, but until you're inside of it looking at the plants that are for sale and thinking the, the Look place at the is going to blow down. I see what you're saying, and Karen. And that's what I was talking I thought about. you were saying, no, no, yes. No, 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 no. Yeah. I was saying share that information with them. Look at the A joint meeting. The perfect location. The greenhouse. That would be great. Sounds great. We've got one coming up in November. November so in a greenhouse month. with holes in it. Let's do it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we could just go by there first. Well, no. What do you Point think, us Cindy? in our world. <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as student safety goes, we might be able to get it done if everything comes together over Christmas vacation. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was that would that would there. be great because you know I've even I mean I've heard the elm word, you know that that's that's there, and you know that's. That's just not a good word. <laughs> In what word? The mold word. Oh. The uh, M word. You made I can't me say even it. Imagine that there's not mold in there. <clears throat> I was thinking mice. I just, I think I, oh. <laughs> that too. That too. As long as the roosters, I don't care. <laughs> and, you know, I just. That's the way. 
I, I think this is, you know, and we talked earlier about teachers having instructional supplies and materials that they needed to teach their children. And I know that this is a lot more than copy paper. I do know that. But it is needed to teach well, that horticulture if curriculum. The can't take the course. Right. Could there you, you go. They could can't you call take the, the company and see how long it would take to construct that? Okay. I could do it. Yep. Or I'll have Abby and Missy do it. All right. So... So at this point, what do you want to do? Well, what do you think, Mark? What do I think? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, let me, let me take that back. What do I think? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think it's up to the board on what type of timeline you want to put this on. Um, as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, look, uh, I think we ought to have a greenhouse. I think we ought to have a lot of things. Okay. I don't but think it was against the greenhouse. We get ready to talk yeah. about a budget again, and I kept hearing that we didn't have any money, and we were going to be in the red very shortly. And I'm not saying that that greenhouse shouldn't be uh, fixed better than it ever was. That's not what I'm saying. But we can't grow we money. I understand what you're saying. And we need to get them over there on the commissioner's side, and we need to meet with the commissioners at some reasonable time, even if it's a group of three at a time or two or whatever, and get them over there and let them see what's going on and then have a short timeline of discussion on it. And I think that's reasonable. I, I, <coughs> I, would, I would encourage trying to get the grants, but if that's not um, – well, we can do both. And we can, right. we can start working and, on the grants. And Renee has come up with some more. So, um, right, and if any of the grants are on a quick timeline, if we do the work and we get the grants, that's still our money that could be, we're saying we're putting this and we put our man hours or people hours towards getting this money. That's our way of doing it without going into our own budget. Is, now, right. tell me about the um, capital outlay improvement. I know we have a budget. We had that marked for certain things. Is it possible to look at some of those things and see if they could wait a little bit longer? I mean, is that allowed? The, well, that's, yeah. Well, it, we, we have to act on it here, uh -huh. and then we have to notify the, the county commissioners that there's been a revision in priorities. Uh, because they were given the the preliminary listing that uh, we approved, and, and I would say that you know definitely Matt would have to be here to talk about you know what improvements are uh, already in capital outlay and, and what might be postponed. Okay. How about the lottery funds have they already been committed to capital outlay projects? They're part of that same report. Yes. I did send Missy a message and ask about the specifics for students. Why it was? She said spec. Spacing, and I'm sorry, spacing and the space between aisles for students to work was the biggie. Most greenhouses have five to six people working and not 25 like she would have in the class. So it was the spacing, and it also allows them to grow more of a variety with different temperature zones. So it's not just that the whole greenhouse is one temp. Mm -hmm. um, she has also sent this to the consultant to give him the educational specs that will, all of the educational specs that will set it apart, not just those things. She does know that this greenhouse has the higher side walls, as Mr. Monroe mentioned, so that students will not hit their heads from the hanging pots. Okay. Well, you want to put this on the agenda for the November 1st meeting? I do think so. I, I would, and I would, um, you know, could we possibly get a committee working with Renee and Mr. Monroe and Miss mm -hmm. Swain and Mr. Meads and maybe the FFA officers? Yeah, the, the more people, the better. So we're putting it on the agenda to do what? Um, well, we'll get more Thinking information. Having all these answers, yeah. these questions get answered. Get more information and, and maybe make a decision of some sort if we have the information. Uh, do you want to – Commissioners prior to that? Yeah, I was going to say, do you want, me, do you want us to me to contact Dan Scanlon and set up a tour? Ask him, well, ask him if, if they'll go at their leisure between now and our November 1st meeting so that we don't have to go as a, a group if that's more or, easier Or we could them. go as a group. It's hard. We well, it is yeah. hard, yeah. but it's hard, hard to them. schedule yeah. 12. But well, we could just all go over there prior to the meeting. It's right around the corner. Yeah. 
if we wanted to. Okay. That's, you mean the meeting with them or our yeah. board meeting? The meeting with them. Well, we're not going to meet yeah, with them until, until after our oh, okay. board meeting. Okay, yes, ma'am. All right. However, Are we? I just feel like at some point they need to be in there and see that space and they need to see that um, number, and then we ha need to have a number for the site prep, and we need to have a number for the concrete, and we need to paint that whole picture. And you know, actually, um, I know a concrete person who would probably donate his labor. So we, you know, I'll, I'll certainly do what I can to maybe get some local grants. So we're gonna put it on the November 1st agenda? But we definitely need to get them to yeah. go at their leisure. I think that's I a think good it idea. Be easier to get them to go I at their too, leisure. Because when they're going by, they can just drop by the greenhouse yeah. and look at it. I think that would be beneficial. I think that's good. Anything else? Is, uh, is so. I just got Mark. Where, is, is, are were you aware before all this? I mean, that that they weren't offering the ag courses as a result of the condition of the greenhouse. No. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> next item. Second reading for revision to policy 3410, testing and assessment program. Ms. Rose? What? <laughs> Ms. Rose. I'm just reading what it has here. What? I don't know what I don't know what I'm supposed to talk about. This, this is the, the this is the one with the A, yeah. the A, the You're students right. to be oh, exempt from okay. the final exam. <laughs> it, it's second reading, so if that's the proposal, we have to decide if that's a proposal okay. or whether we go with Knapp's proposal that says all classes are important and so all all people should take final exam. I I did check into that a little bit further. I you know when I got home that evening, I know it was said at the last board meeting, you know that it was they may be exempt, but when I looked at the Curry Tech County High School handbook online, it does not say that. It says they will be exempt. So, um I know it is a, you know, it's it's like a, you know, it doesn't matter how old the children are, high school or whatever. They like to be rewarded for good grades, and, and that is, and I know that um, most of the classes, they have to take end of course exams, and so it's, it, I think it makes kids come to school when they have the option, um, but I, I think it makes them work hard. You know, I'm not saying to do away with exempting students who have a B and two or fewer absences, but I do think an A is an A, and if you've mastered the material, you should be exempt, whether you have two absences or three, because an A is what we're shooting for. So shall I make a motion? Well, wait a well, minute. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, May is still in the policy, so that gives a teacher the option to uh, either give the final exam or not. And that, that's a problem, see? And there, there's a lot of these problems with the Curry Tuck County Schools Handbook and the individual schools handbooks, because they're not the same. <clears throat> So, but to your point about they would be rewarded, they like to be rewarded, part of the reward in the current policy, as I see it, is they're being rewarded. For being not, there. Well, it's a twofer. You, you, you got to get an A, and you got to be there to be rewarded. So. No, so, you can have a B, you can have an 80, and one or two absences, and you have no exam, or you well, I think can I need to get rid of that part. Anyways. Or you can have a ninety-seven <clears throat> and three or four absences, and you have to take the exam. Well, I think you should have to be there. But it, but it kind of conflicts our new policy that took away ten days, and you don't pass, or you may be in jeopardy of passing. No, we I took that away. I didn't vote for that either. But, but we did take it away. So even though you didn't vote for it, it's no, our I policy. I, I believe that you got to be where you're supposed to be and that's how you get rewarded but, that's how it trains you to be successful in later life is showing up and doing what you're supposed to do i so. understand what you think about that but that is their policy but you know i it, can i make a motion well can i just say one thing first of all if it's in the handbook for this year i don't think we can change it mid-year okay well, uh, your handbook can't violate policy well because so we can change says, the policy, and then the handbook's going to be wrong, and then we're going to be 
dealing with that all year from anybody. Go ahead. Well, we can we can revise the handbook online. Huh? We can revise the handbook online. Yeah. Yeah. I just know that people will be. It, I it, I and I don't I don't ripple, know we'll I don't know it. that any I mean. What would you students think if we revise the policy to say students will be exempt from an exam that does not have an end of course for the state if they have an A? In, in, end of sentence. If you have an excessive amount of unexcused absences, I do think that there's no excuse, even if you have an A, like there is no excuse for that's, having an that's, excessive amount. That's in there. After the discussion last time, unexcused absences takes you out of the exemption. Okay. Right. Yeah. I was just wondering about that. Yeah, because. that's in there now. But honestly, Sydney, do you think if you have an excessive amount of absences that you would have an A? No. Okay. Because <laughs> you need to be there to get the instruction. I think one of the counterpoints was that teachers who teach those classes where it says they will be exempt. It makes it so that their classes are essentially deemed less valuable. less valuable. So if it does say they are, like absolutely are exempt, I think it would be beneficial to give the teachers the choice in that matter, like whether or not their, their exam is optional in those ways. Um, I agree with what you said about the fact that if there is the possibility of an exemption from an exam that students will strive harder to get the A and make sure that they're there and make sure that they're getting an A so that they don't have to take the exam because people do have test anxiety and things like that. And I know that I'm the type of person to try to get an A regardless of exam or not, but I know that especially in my COA classes, my biology class right now, if you get an A in it, you don't have to take the final exam. And I know that there's a lot of people in my biology class right now that are studying harder than they've ever studied just to make sure that they don't have to take that exam. Because so. the exam is typically harder and right, could exactly. pull your grade down. Exactly. Comprehensive. Um, definitely going to have to agree with Keelan as well. Uh, if the teachers are thinking that their tests or their class aren't as important because of that rule, give them the choice. Because if they do feel like it's important for everyone to take that exam, then by all means, have them make it required for that class. Um, another thing with it, too, is that the exam tests the knowledge throughout the whole class. It's not just a test on one section. So it's also a good way for teachers especially to um, see their progress and see how kids retained all the information rather than just learning a couple vocabulary words, knowing them, testing on them, and then forgetting them afterwards. So I think it really has to be up to the teacher whether or not um, they're going to require it. Uh, personally, I like the way NAP does it with having everyone take the exam because that's just how I've always had it. But if you had the choice, I would say give the teachers an option whether or not to require it. And I think that's always great to let teachers have input. So we just want to leave the May be tested? And possibly take out the number of days absent? I, I thought you, I thought you did for the A's. I thought you said if you had, they had the A. I didn't, I didn't think the days were still there, just the B's. I'm sorry. The B's had up to, up to two. Yeah. And then the last, uh, at the last one, there was concern about unexcused absences. So if the A student has any unexcused, then that policy uh, uh, provision falls away. Can you read the new one? Can I read the new one? <laughs> no, I didn't bring my laptop. <clears throat> I have the one that doesn't have the unexcused in there. As recognition for good attendance and academic performance, a student with an A average may be exempt from final exams in courses which do not require state exams. A student with a B average and not missing more than two days during the semester will be eligible for an exemption. Students will not be exempted from EOC tests NC fi or fi NC final exams, and students will not be um, um, eligible for this waiver 
if they have unexcused absences. Okay. I, I kind of think that covers it. it. It still says May. We need to put something in there. They suggested about teacher mm -hmm. discretion. Well, if it That's May. May. That's the May. Okay. May yeah. would take May, care yeah. of that? Really? Yeah. It's already done, right? Well, no, we haven't approved well, the we wording. we haven't approved it, but it's oh, been my. written. Yes. That's, okay. Okay. Do I have a motion for approval as it was read? Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Next item. Second reading of revisions to policy 6420 contracts with the board. Ms. Trussell. Um, this policy we're proposing that the the cap of contracts that have to be reported to the board would be ninety thousand instead of fifty thousand, and a few um, exemptions, such as itemized items in the annual capital outlay budget, and also utility purchases property insurance from the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, and the purchase of diesel fuel. Basically, all things that we don't have any control over anyway. True, and we do we do a um, blanket purchase order every year at the beginning of the year to cover the utilities, so that's why they're listed. Okay. And um, the other exceptions were recommended by the lawyer. Um, and then we would be reporting to you contracts ranging 50 and above at the next meeting. Okay. I'll go with that. Questions? So we're not going to be um, knowing about until after it's done contracts up to ninety thousand dollars. That would be true. They're and they're all, generally the the same contracts happen every year. So we're going to be placing the contracts over a certain amount out for bid. Still, is that what we're doing too? Um, over ninety wouldn't come to before you. So we're not going to. We're not, uh, but if you had a contract, for example, for sixty thousand dollars, would it be out for bid? Yes. Informally, right? Informally. Informally, yeah. What is it? What is it now? How, how do we? Right I know now you, it's fifty thousand. I know you right, the cap, right? but when do you put things out for bid? Was there a, is there a limit on that? A number? The our for board service. policy says two or more quotes when feasible so 90 and above we put it out for bid and we hope to get two or more quotes or two more two or more bids okay um some things are bid out some things it's not possible to bid it out like utilities yes ma'am and, and i totally understand that on, on, under 90 what happens typically is uh, uh the maintenance department or the finance department is out there checking quotes it's not a formal bid process but they'll call people and they'll say you know what can you do this service for and and you get numbers from different uh, companies i think it's a lot of money i think that we ought to be getting bids for services under ninety thousand dollars personally i mean that you know i think they do okay mm -hmm. yeah i think that's, they I'm get confused. bids i don't think that's what we're addressing aren't we addressing that we don't need to um that y'all are getting the bids involved, and we don't have to approve unless it's it. ninety thousand or more. Is that That's correct? True. Okay. We don't have to wait for board approval. Okay. We can we can approve the contract, Mr. Stefanik can sign off on it, okay. and then we bring it to you the next board meeting if it's over fifty thousand. But but even still we don't put contracts out for a real bid unless they're over ninety thousand dollars. That's currently. true. Right. Yeah. Okay, I, 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 I wasn't saying that's what you were talking about, but in my understanding of what we're talking about, that part I don't, I don't think makes me true. uncomfortable. I think, we, I think we get bids. Matt, I know we get here, bids. But, I mean, I'm sorry? I well, think we get bids for under You just said 90. we don't bid. I know, but I know, Matt, I know that they do on so, in some cases. We cases. do get quotes. Yeah, you get, yeah, yeah, you, you get quotes. That's what I Yeah, you get quotes. That's, that's the same thing as a bid to me. It, it was it well, and it was the same thing. Lori, uh, was it just last year that you talked about the $30,000, $40,000 savings in 
one of our plans, I one of our insurance plans. Insurance. Yeah, she she called around and was finding out. You shop around and find the best prices, and then you can change companies if you find a better price. And I and I applaud her for doing that. And I spoke about it then, and I'll tell her once again that was great. The problem, though, is that do we have a process that says at X amount we're going to do this? And that's just my question. And I'm sorry to take up so much time, but I just feel like, okay, Matt might do it different than she does it if there's not a process that we all adhere to. And I'm just looking for, or some new hire comes in or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and I just don't want somebody spending 50 grand and then later or 60 or whatever and buying a greenhouse and finding out <laughs> that that they only got two quotes from some company that's on the internet that flies under the radar with the same company under two different identifiers. I, I you know, I just Well, perhaps like we should say must get three quotes. Well, we have another policy that covers all that, so you okay. have to amend it and I didn't no. I didn't bring it with me. Yeah. So, but it's a, the standard state policy. Yeah. I, I know the, the people that do the most contracts, it's maintenance, and it's Matt Mullins, and it's Lori. Okay. And they don't do anything just over the Internet. Right. They're, they're on the phone with people. They're talking through, um, you know, the contracts. For example, the, the lease busing process, we've had two, I think, two different representatives from the company. We've had uh, their lawyers, our lawyers, Matt, me, uh, you know, all on to make sure that we're getting the best um, process and we're going through the whole, uh, you know, process the right way. We didn't have to go through the bid process on that because the company we're working with is on state contract. Mm -hmm. And so the state went through the, um, the bidding process and so we can get the group purchase rate, which is the lowest rate. And so we got away from the bidding process on that. But that whenever right, that's, that, that's a legal, that's a legal exception. Yes. And we do always try to include local bids. I'm sure we support local. Yes. Right? We don't have a bus company in Curitiba. I know, I know. <laughs> but we did in North Carolina. Did we use that one? This is the person that has the North Carolina contract okay. for buses. Yes. It must not be Thomas. I, I don't know exactly. I don't know exactly where they're housed, but they have the contract. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Do I have a motion for approval for so, policy sixty-four twenty? So moved. Second. I have a motion and second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Motion passes. Next item, second reading of revisions to policy 9120, bidding for construction work. Lori? Uh, yes, and this follows suit with the, the last policy. We would be changing um, any construction or repair contract involving expenditures in excess. We would be changing from 50000 to 90000 The same situation that mm -hmm. we just did. Okay. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that I know Matt is on the phone uh, trying to get the best deals. For example, the Shawboro wastewater. Yeah. Yeah. He's been calling all over trying to see if anybody else will service so that we have a competitive bid for this gentleman. And they're all saying he trained us. He's the best one. And so you probably should stick with him. Um, so he does call for contractor work uh, on those repairs. So what did he get uh, as a bid on a uh, renovation on the greenhouse? <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm saying we got to get him on this see, team, Renee. Saying, we do this, <laughs> and then, then Janet, you don't even have to worry we're, about it because we, I was going to say we're, we're talking, it, we're talking new. So I don't think you checked on renovation costs because Janet's this been project, talking new. This project of this okay. greenhouse has been talked more about by this board than anything saying, I can though, remember. Do I have a Do I have a motion that we approve <laughs> the revisions to policy 9120 bidding for construction work? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have a motion that we <laughs> approve the revisions to policy 9120 bidding for construction work? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Do I have a motion and a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Are you awake? Okay. You're, you're on the next one. That's why I asked. Second reading of revisions to policy 5010, parent organization. Okay. I just wanted to be sure with this, and I know it says parent organizations, and I, of course, think Booster Club or Band Club. And, you know, I'm sure that we're already following these rules, but I know that sometimes my concern is really for the donations to the school system. And actually, these are not donations to the school system I'm worried about. It's donations made for our students, like us changing this is not going to prevent 
parents from donating money for football meals, correct? No, no. Okay. No, no. Are parents donating money to the volleyball team for their pink jerseys or uh, tournament? We can still do all that without going through red tape. Yeah, all, all it says on here is that um, that parent groups can't operate independent of the school. That's what these new pieces are. And it okay. says on here they put clarification languages to make sure that they're touching base with the principal before they move forward. And I used to say that when I was a principal to our PTAs. They're always trying to do what's best, but sometimes when they just they get a donation, it may not have anything to do with the school program. And so then when they come forward, they said, yeah, we'll really have to turn that donation down because we really can't use it. I see. Uh, and so you just have to double check with the principal, making sure that it's in the best interest of the activity or the overall school program. I, I just know we have a lot of donations that come through for our students. Sure. And, uh, you know, there are parents that like doing that, whether it be the football meals or whatever, and I don't want to put anything in place that will hamper that. No, it's just making sure that the, the administration knows what the parent group is doing. That's all that provision means. So Wasn't if, there also a change that two people had to sign off on deposits? Yes. That one, I think we got cleared up at the last meeting, but then there were some concerns about some of this new language, and that's why we put it on hold. So if we have a group of parents that want to do the football meals, they just need to run it through Dr. Matney. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Or, or if they typically go through um, Todd Parker, and Todd Parker and Dr. Matney are on the same page, then, okay. then that. And, and by the same token, you've got a parent that wants to buy the pink out jerseys. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Correct? They just have to run it by Dr. Matney. Just have to notify folks on what's going on. Okay. Um, and, and what I'll say on that. I don't want to deter that. No, I understand. But if it's, uh, if you said jerseys or if you're talking about shirts, and, and, and that's a perfect example, you just have to make sure that by putting those special jerseys on, you're not violating some high school athletic association policy. Right. And that's why coach. the parent, the, yeah, they yeah, the, the coach right. and the athletic right. director and the, and the principal, right, you go through all those things. We're not saying that we don't appreciate the donation. You just have to make sure that the team doesn't suffer because they weren't in an official uniform or something like that. Um, and just get all those exceptions to the rules, and then they want to donate it, then they're clear to go. Because I can see this being a problem if we stop parents from being involved. Oh, no, that's not the intent at all. It's not the intent With at all. With donations. Yeah, that is not the intent at all. No, no. It's just, it, it says in here in, in, the, in the recommendation pieces um, from uh, school boards associations just says you just have to make sure that they communicate with the school so that parent organizations aren't operating independent uh, of the school or the school district. Oh, well, honestly, these donations are not coming through a parent organization. It's just a few parents getting together and doing the football meals. Or Even, even more important, that, that they just check. They just yeah. check with people, that's all, instead of just showing up with whatever. Yeah. yeah, they just have to make sure they tell people what they're doing. Okay. Okay, do I have a motion to approve the second reading and revisions to policy 5010, parent organization? So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. And Ms. Rose, with that, if, if anybody feels that way, have them contact me, and, yeah. and I'll explain why it's there. Well, I know we've had, like, restaurants donate even, you sure. know, the meals. So sure. we want to encourage that community support. Yes, as, as a lifetime school person, we don't turn down donations very often. We, <laughs> we're very open okay, to Okay, next item, second reading of revisions to policy 1710. 4021, 7230, Prohibition Against Discrimination, Harassment, and Bullying. Superintendent Stefanik. We had some requests for some additional information uh, on this, and then because of uh, uh, some wording changes, it was just asked to put this off to the second reading until um, this month so people had a month to review uh, any of the changes. Uh, the one question that was asked that we check on was that when um, they added uh, board members to the policy if that if there was any recommendations for consequences should a board member uh, be um, alleged uh, to have harassed or bullying somebody and the recommendation was that after investigation unless it reaches the uh, um, 
the legal level where you have to involve the uh, uh, the law enforcement agencies that uh, they didn't have any recommendations to put with the policy. Any questions, comments? Do I have a motion that we approve the second reading of revisions to policy 1710, 4021, 7230, prohibition against discrimination, harassment, and bullying? I'll make a motion. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Okay, next item, 2018-2019 fiscal year budget review and adoption. Ms. Trussell. Hello again. Um, we discussed in the work session the, the budget resolution and the budget for this current year. Uh, the state public school fund will have a little over $27 million to be approved tonight. Local current expense, almost $11.5 million. Federal grants, a little over $1 million. Capital outlay fund, $2.2 million. Child nutrition fund, a little over $1.7 million. Other local fund, $1.1 million for a grand total of... Uh, $44.6 million. And I always want to add that this is a moving target. We've already received two more allocations from the state since this budget was prepared. So they'll come to you as budget amendments. Um, also, with that being said, just we did this last year and we were informing the commissioners of how our budget works. We are just now starting October. We've had 12 revisions. Uh, from the state uh, already. I think the 12th allotment email revision came today. Uh, so they're averaging about two a week, uh, you know, since we started the school year. They're not taking money back, are they? Not yet. Not yet. No, they've just been, uh, they're trying to catch up on uh, allocations that haven't been uh, passed out yet. And we're still waiting for some federal funds. So that total, I hope, will go up by the next time I bring budget amendments. Okay, you want to mention your uh, projection for a fund balance at the end of this fiscal year? Yes, sir. Um, I think by the end of this year, we'll have approximately $424,000 remaining in our fund balance. That's the local current expense fund balance. What is our monthly operating expense? For local funds? No, just to operate our school system. Any idea? Divide that 44 by 12. Four yeah, by 44 12. divided by 12, so between three and a half and four million dollars a month. Okay. Okay, any other questions for uh, Ms. Trussell? Um, no, I don't have any questions for Ms. Trussell. Okay. I have a comment that I think we should uh, do a better job um, meeting and discussing this information in the future so for future budgets I would like to see that happen it's got nothing to do with Ms. Trussell she's doing a great job I know she thinks I pick on her but I don't mean to and uh, I'm just trying to get the information so I have a clear understanding so that when I communicate with the commissioners and we can all speak the same language and um, I can paint a picture in hopes that they can see it a little clearer and that's all I'm trying to do Perhaps we should have a budget retreat instead of just an hour or two one evening, you know, maybe a daytime thing. Well, I was just getting ready to say we did make plans at the work session that we would do that, but you, I'm in agreement with you that if we're going to do it, it needs to be done before now, not after. Right. I mean, at this point, to try to hash this out, we're late in the game. Not that there's anything that is we can change at this point. And I think, I, end of year is very hectic. I know it is, but. I think, though, that we could get a lot of information, even if we didn't change anything and understand it better, would help our lines of communication when we're trying to. Sell the schools. Get more resources. <laughs> That's all. It's not, it's not that you're doing anything bad. It's just that you didn't. It's not your job to come with us and set it up and have the conversation started. I just think we should do a better job collectively in doing that. Okay, this budget's been developed how long? 
Um, finished it last Thursday. Okay. Well, then uh, maybe next time, if that's the case, and we're this short, then we got to figure out a, another way to put it off and discuss it. Well, well it's know. like, you know, it's like I mentioned at the work session, we all need to get together, right. go through the local budget, and, you know, find out where we think we can cut some items since Correct. year but, after next we're going to be running out of money. Yeah, and I, 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 don't, I, I don't have any answers to that, just like uh, no one else here does, because I agree with you. We need to look at not only the local budget, but the whole budget, and right. we need to do a better job of communicating. Right. Well, the sad part about that, looking at where we can cut with the local budget, is the majority of the local funds are positions. Okay. Okay, do I have a motion that we approve the 2018-19 fiscal year budget? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion on that? We have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. All right, thank you. Okay, field trips request that Mr. Stefanik is approved. Do you want to go over those fairly quickly? Very quickly. Uh, so have some of our uh, student groups um, having their uh, uh, conventions or um, annual conferences. Uh, FFA is going to their national convention in Indianapolis um, here in a couple of weeks, the end of October. Um, FBLA National Fall Leadership Conference is in Charlotte, and uh, that's happening November 13th, 15th to the 18th, and JPK um, SAD State Conference in Raleigh November 16th through the 18th. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next consent agenda. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. <clears throat> Next information items. Next work session will be November 1st, 2018 at the Knapp Professional Learning Center at 4 o'clock. And next Board of Education meeting will be here November 1st at the courthouse at 6.30. Okay. okay, board member and superintendent comments. Mr. Stefanik. For the first time ever, nothing to report, Dr. Domnick. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Saved us Must be Florence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next, Mr. Craddock. Um, well, um, I had the, um, uh, well, the pleasure of uh, working with uh, Dr. Dobney and uh, Mark and Matt and uh, Miss uh, Melissa Futural. 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 Yes. Yep. Uh, putting a presentation with the uh, Tourism Advisory Board to try to uh, see if we couldn't get them to buy into some uh, bus wraps on our activity buses. We were trying to see if we could get them to collectively uh, pay for our seven activity buses that go to many different locations across several states and see if they'd buy into the concept of marketing on the sides of them. And so we all went over there and I think we did a pretty good job and hopefully uh, they'll uh, not only get the benefit of some good advertising, but they'll uh, get the benefit of uh, a good school system or a better school system if we get the money and utilize it properly. And I'm sure we will. And basically they will be able to help the citizens without um, getting it out of the general fund. And I think uh, that's something that could legally be done and I would encourage them to do so. And I look forward to it. Also, um, I'd like to congratulate uh, uh, the coach at, uh, the uh, baseball coach, uh, Justin Hill, uh, for uh, the field uh, recognition, uh, the best field. And the person that does a lot, that uh, pitches in and um, basically heads up that field maintenance uh, treatment operation is uh, Christian Richardson mm -hmm. and I'd really like to uh, thank them for what they uh, have uh, well him particularly for what he's accomplished on all the different fields but mm -hmm. uh, that baseball field was recognized and he's done uh, so many other fields uh, that really uh, are, are really done nice and with that um, I hope everybody's uh, looking forward to uh, a fall uh, season looks like it was upon us until today and um, Anyhow, with that, I'd say uh, have a happy Halloween, and uh, God bless uh, Curtuck County. 
Okay, Ms. Rose. I'd like to thank Dr. Dobney and Mr. Craddock and staff for going before the Tourism Board and asking for the money um, for our buses uh, to serve as advertisement. I can't think of a better way to spend the tourism dollars. Um, hats off to the Moyoc Elementary Panthers and their penny war that they raised $5,109 for a student, her name is Savannah, she's at the school, and I think we heard this mentioned earlier, she's um, undergoing some treatments for a mass in her brain, and I, I just think that's awesome that they all came together and brought their pennies in to raise $5,000 to help with medical cost. Um, also, a shout out to our JP Knapp SAD members who held a yard sale this past weekend to help defer cost for their big field trip coming up. And our FFA group from the high school who did a lot of fundraisers as well um, to help defer their cost to the national convention. I'm real proud of our FFA chapter, our local chapter, for holding the regional rally yesterday. I think there were about 288 students here from all over Northeast North Carolina. And I popped in out there and saw lots of good leadership going on from our students. And that's it. Didn't you say that Mary Kate Morgan was one of the presenters? Mary Kate was. And we actually have two regional officers from Curry Tuck. Uh, Claudia Morgan serves as the Northeast Region President. And Abby Rose serves as the Secretary for the Northeast Region. And they were... Uh, Sydney was there. All the lots of FFA students were there helping. It was a, a collaborative effort from our local chapter. Right. We also had state officers come in to our regional leadership conference and visit with us and get to know us better. Mm -hmm. And it was just so many different stations, and the students traveled to these presentations led by our leaders of tomorrow. And I don't know if the four of you know Mary Kate, but she was a student board member when she was in school. Okay, Ms. Etheridge. Yes. Well, here it is, October. Fall sports are in full swing. Come out and support our nights. I was able to attend uh, Central Elementary's Grandparents' Day Luncheon, and I want to commend Ms. Chapel for always having the enthusiasm in that school. You can just tell that everybody works really well together. I had a, a great time with my granddaughter, Alyssa, eating lunch that day. Um, I'd like to ask the public to really research the candidates that are on the ballot this fall in our November election here locally and our state um, um, state candidates. Please do your research and really find out what they stand for. Take the time. Don't just go to the polls just to vote. I know everybody's pushing voting, 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 but really um, find out what it's all about and who you want to support and uh, do your research. And thank you very much. Hey, Ms. Kraft. Yes, um, I visited all the schools this month. Um, my thoughts and prayers um, tonight are with Deidre Simmons and her husband as they undergo this next um, medical challenge that they have. I spent a good portion of the September 19th workday sitting in on uh, some of the professional development sessions. I was very impressed. The curriculum team leaders did a wonderful job, and people are working together to coordinate and make sure that we're all on the same page with, um, with our um, standards. I attended the beginning of the, the National Board informational meeting that was led by Christy Hodges. I always try to welcome students or teachers who are interested in National Board, so I did that. And I um, attended a volleyball game against Bertie on Tuesday night where uh, we just have an awesome volleyball team. Thank you. I got to uh, see one of 18 holes of golf between two of the best high school golfers in the state. And this was a uh, day before yesterday. And that's Catherine Schuster from First Flight High School and Bailey Twyford oh. from Curry Tuck High School. And the match ended up, they each shot a 66, which is six under par. Wow. <laughs> which is incredible. Yeah. So anyway, they'll be back at the state championship again this year. I also got, uh, went back to the hunter safety uh, field because Daniel Meads, who takes care of it, told me that he's made some improvements back there, and it's getting to look really nice. He's doing a quality job. 
on that. And then to go back to the uh, tourism, the meeting that we had with them, wrapping our buses with scenes from uh, Curita County would act as mobile billboards because they go all over, the activity buses go all over the uh, state and they wouldn't be static billboards like we have here in the county. And then uh, Mr. Cronick had a great idea because we have these new ball fields over by the Extension Center. And he said, since a lot of our activity buses go to athletic events, what a better way for people to find out about those ball fields than to look at our activity buses that may have a scene from them on there. So great idea there. And with that... Well, I, I just couldn't stay silent the whole time. <laughs> oh, so close. <laughs> so, uh, it, it's about the activity buses. Uh, I've heard a couple of people say that uh, uh, the money that we're going to get from tourism is to pay for the buses, no. um, and, and that, that's not accurate. Um, the uh, buses come out of um, capital outlay, uh, and once we get the contract finalized and the commissioners act on it, basically it says that they'll make sure that we at least have the $120,000 or $130,000 in capital outlay to pay the annual lease cost to the busing company. The tourism dollars are general fund, or will go into our general fund dollars, and we can earmark those for specific programs, or we could buy additional teachers, you know, pretty much uh, whatever we uh, declare as the biggest need uh, at the time in the school district. Um, so capital outlay takes care of the bus lease, and the, the tourism money takes care of education needs uh, in the Currituck School District. Yeah, and that would come out of the uh, tourism promotional dollars and not their building fund dollars. So. Okay, do I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Do I have a second? I have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>